you for joining me today, Daniel. Thank you. It's a pleasure of having you. You're originally from Manchester and you began your legal career back in England. Why did you move to Melbourne? Well, I um, went backpacking in my gap year after I finished university in my early 20s and uh, I spent a short time in Australia uh, and about two weeks in Melbourne. I just fell in love with Melbourne, just the city and the, the culture, the people here, the weather. So I had a long-term plan when I went back to England for a few years um, to eventually come back to, to Melbourne and as it turned out I um, became admitted as a lawyer at a law firm in Oxford uh, and after a short period um, from then I then moved to Melbourne and um, got myself requalified here. Did you have a job already lined up before moving to Melbourne? No, I did make some uh, initial effort from England to have a job lined up before I came but it, in reality it was too difficult without being on the ground without having a presence or a history here all I had when I did come was a semester of um, studying law at Monash which I needed to do to requalify and um, uh, by the end of that semester I then secured a, a, a job as a trainee lawyer here so uh, I went on from then. How did you secure your your first job? Just in the usual way which is particularly at that stage when I was very junior and just sending out CVs and um, cold calling and um, to that extent it's a numbers game and uh, so I, I got lucky with uh, one employer who then uh, who, who I met for an interview and was offered the job. It's fantastic. Out of all the areas of law why did you choose family law? Well I first came across family law when I studied it at university and it was probably the only area where I would um, have gone out my way to, to read about it um, by choice because it's not a dry academic subject like contract law say. It's, it's about how society functions and things such as how um, uh, marriages themselves are treated. There's, uh, there's been um, a lot of case law over the years about how to recognise and quantify the contributions made by uh, a primary homemaker or parent versus uh, the more traditional breadwinner for example and touches on issues on the welfare and development of children. So when I then started practicing the area the thing I um, found I enjoyed was the variety of personalities that you, you come across and all the different issues. It, um, means I have to be across different areas of the law. There's so much overlap with things such as um, criminal law, uh, commercial law, counting issues and I think I've um, got much more sense of various um, social sciences such as uh, mental health issues and domestic violence and various addictions and so I enjoy the, the breadth uh, of issues you have to be across. I think finally as well, unlike some other areas of the law, it's a uh, bit practicing in family law allows you to make a real difference and have some level of control over the outcome. I'm not simply a small cog in a, in a big wheel. I mean, it, it gives you a high degree of responsibility, which adds its own pressures, but it's something I, that I enjoy. So, so in, in family law, you're dealing with so many different people with so many different emotions. Yeah. How do you manage these emotions so it doesn't affect you personally? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that it is an inherently emotional area that's often because you're not just dealing with the breakdown of the relationship itself but it's the uncertainty that goes alongside that um, so one or both of the parties they may have been happy to a degree in the relationship up until a certain point and then suddenly the future that they envisage both um, financially is up in the air and often the nature and extent of the relationship they have with their children is a lot more uncertain and actually the person who they were most close to previously is the person who they're now in often a fairly contentious hostile battle with so um, it is emotional for that reason I think what I try and consciously do is not get too emotionally invested in my client's own story. I have to engage with it in a very empathetic way, but not to become a formal counsellor, 
and it's about trying to maintain a balance between having that level of empathy to understand where they're coming from, what's important to them, and uh, maintaining a professional distance. I think in practice one way of doing that as well is to have a mentor, whether that's uh, the barrister that you're working on a particular case or um, colleagues around you, or um, even if it's just a, a friend outside the law, family law war story is always pretty interesting to listen to, so you won't, it, it, no one will have any difficulty in getting someone to, to hear those stories, which may just allow you to bounce off some ideas or let off steam at the end of the day. So. What are some other challenges you face in family law? Um, I think the most difficult types of cases I come across, and this would apply to any family lawyer, are the cases that go to court, because even though I said earlier that in family law you have some degree of control over the outcome, that's where um, inherently you actually do lose quite a lot of control because um, you're ultimately subject to a judge who has to make a decision in a very discretionary and subjective area of the law so from the lawyer's perspective it's difficult to give any definitive advice which they may really otherwise want um, and for the clients themselves they experience um, the added stress and off, uh, of the litigation often that puts parties into our respective corners and things become more hostile than they otherwise are. The process becomes more expensive for clients. So one way I try and deal with those issues is, and this would apply in and out of court matters, but perhaps even more so in uh, the heated battle of a court case, is to do things such as reinforce advice uh, regularly in writing, uh, to reality test outcomes with, with clients and to seek second opinions uh, and bring in other experts as necessary. So that may be, that, that for example, that might uh, be a barrister uh, who's brought into the case or often there's aspects of the case that can be referred out uh, to other um, finance professionals if it's a property matter or if there are um, children's issues involved to instruct a um, psychologist to uh, assist your client will prepare a report that's favourable to them and so on. So it doesn't, uh, do, even though I'm the client's family lawyer, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm the only professional that they will benefit um, from seeing. So I like to deal with things in a more holistic way in that, in that manner. Is that something you learnt or did someone tell you? Well, it's just through experience that um, of practising in, in the area for about 10 years and I found that's a very effective way of dealing with things. The other thing I should mention as well is to try and have matters that don't go to court in the first place and I'm a particular advocate of collaborative law um, which um, from the outset changes the dynamics between the parties and instead of them being almost by definition at loggerheads and uh, in a court case it becomes a zero-sum game it's more about working together with your client with their ex-partner with their lawyer uh, as a team to, towards more of a shared goal and that way um, there is certainly a lot more control that everybody has in the outcome and the process itself is um, a lot more dignified than in court cases so that's very often the process that I um, will recommend to clients at the outset of their case. I'm curious to know and I'm sure our, our viewers are also curious to know but you've built yourself up to be one of Melbourne's leading family lawyers. How have you done it? Oh, thank you. Um, I read a book uh, about a year ago, um, which many people will have heard of uh, uh, and read, called uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, which I think is a fabulous book and uh, has helped uh, teach me and reinforce various principles about uh, how I interact with people in my everyday life and my professional life. And one of the key principles from the book is to constantly ask yourself or to constantly um, require you to put yourself in the other person's shoes and see things from their perspective. So um, in the context of act acting for a client, that means um, trying to understand from their perspective what's important to them, uh, what their goals are, and to drill a bit deeper underneath the surface of simply what they're saying. Once I do that, I can, once I have a, that broad understanding of what their interests are, I can be become a more powerful and effective advocate um, for them as, as, as clients, which obviously then helps to 
build your uh, reputation as a, a, as a very sound and trustworthy lawyer. I think the same principle applies when communicating with um, my client's ex-partner or, or their lawyer, um, trying to understand how they will perceive correspondence. And more often than not, it's much more effective to try and almost uh, correspond in a way that treats them as equals rather than trying to impose a result on them, um, which nine times out of ten just leads to uh, the other side becoming more defensive and actually making it less likely that they will agree to the things that I'm asking of them on behalf of my client. I think the, the phrase is you catch more um, bees with honey than vinegar and I, I do agree with that. In the, the other aspect to the question is about building a, um, a solid and an extensive referral network which is particularly important to me because many of my clients come through personal referrals and one of the um, things that the book has taught me is um, the value of establishing um, genuine personal uh, connections with the, the people around me in a, a personal and professional context and uh, doing so by taking a genuine sincere interest in them as people and, and I think that combined with being a, a competent sound lawyer who understands all those issues I talk about um, has led me to, to, to where I am at the moment. Where do you see the legal landscape going within the next 10 years? I'm um, a big uh, fan of a professor by the name of uh, Richard Susskind uh, who has written extensively for many years on the future of the legal profession and one of the key themes from his writings is the fact that the um, legal profession will not be immune um, to the IT revolution that uh, is already occurring, has already occurred and continues to. And one of the, the small but significant ways that I already um, encounter that is working in a paperless office. I think that will become the norm within five to ten years. A number of my colleagues within the profession have virtual offices, so they have an online presence and uh, but don't have a physical office except uh, to see clients and I constantly read various articles about um, artificial intelligence and specifically what role that might play within the, the legal profession. So there's certainly opportunities for lawyers and law firms to take advantage of that and then there's also the challenge to make sure that uh, lawyers can add value to the work that they do notwithstanding the fact that out there in the wider world clients have access to so much more information and resources that uh, was unheard of uh, 10 or 20 years ago. For lawyers wanting to or are thinking of doing family law, what's some inside information they should know? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is to have a thick skin. It isn't an area for the faint-hearted. One of the, and this is easier said than done, but I think one of the tricks to try and learn is just to understand that inevitably you'll come across clients and judges and other lawyers who are rude to you or who are uh, fairly mean towards you um, but the, the challenge really is to not take that personally and to try and understand that um, it's that type of conduct is much more about them than it, than it is about you so you have to uh, rem if you remember that from the beginning then you don't get quite as caught up when that inevitably does happen. I would also say just to have an interest in people in the world, in society, um, given the fact that uh, the issues you do come across, as I explained before, is almost infinite. So uh, a curiosity in, in people is uh, a, a required skill, I think. The final thing I'd say is to constantly ask uh, the why question. So in, in everyday practice, ask yourself, why is your client saying a certain thing, why is the, are the other party doing a certain thing uh, and as I mentioned before the, uh, that really goes towards trying to drill down into what the, the fundamental interests of the, the parties actually are so not to be too, too cynical but to have a healthy, healthy level of, of uh, cynicism and just to uh, not necessarily take at face value everything that you see or hear. Daniel, thank you once again for being here today. Thank you.